this morning I can truly say that not only my circle knows this, but you all know that you serve a healing Jesus. Yeah. And he's a healer of the physical animalities that we go through day by day. But I just want to tell you that he's also a healer of your heart. Oh, <laughs> 
us, Heavenly Father. We're here in your sanctuary. We are here, the very gate of heaven. By faith, we can see your throne. We can see your son. He paid the price for this right. And we are claiming that right to come boldly and request your presence, your, your, your power, your strength. That through the Holy Spirit you will teach us in ways that will break down everything so that we can see just your will. Cleanse us, Lord. Fill us. For we are weak without you. And we long to be strong in you, moment by moment, day by day. Lord, you have so much you have given your people. Forgive us, empower us and teach us that we may serve thee in all things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we began to set a foundation. Title being The Great Antitypical Day of Atonement. On the seventh day, Sabbath. Right now, we're just setting the foundation for the Antipical Day of Atonement. And last week, I listed a whole bunch of questions. One comment came back, uh, you didn't answer them. Well, that was because the sermon would have been more than an hour long. So today it's more of a continuation of last week and we're going to answer some more of the questions. So let us begin with defining what atonement means. You see, there's much confusion in Christianity over what Jesus did at the cross and unless we understand it in the light of God's perspective, we'll never understand and we'll be always in danger of believing lies instead of present truth. Amen. From God's Word. So, what does atonement mean? What does it mean? Do we know? To break down the Word, we would say, at one with God. Or at one minute. Being that we're talking about with God, it's at one with God. But let's get a little more detail. The Strong's Concordance gives us the actual definition of the Hebrew word. Kippur. See, if you know Hebrew, you would smile and you'd say, yeah, that's right. That's where we get Yom Kippur from. You see, today is Yom Kippur. In the great Day of Atonement, it's the great and the typical Yom Kippur. It's not only Sabbath, it is the Day of Atonement. We're going to get into this in much detail over the next few times we're together. So what does Kippur mean? Well, it means expiation. <laughs> and so we have a dear sister saying, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> Boy, Pastor, you're going around the barn a few times here. Well... The Strong's Concordance put it this way, and I love the Strong's because it helps you really understand. 
The act of atoning for crime. The act of making satisfaction for an offense. And I love this one. By which the guilt is done a what? Done away. And the obligation of the offended person to punish the crime is what? Canceled. This definition right here is exactly what is going on in the antitypical Day of Atonement. Christ is in mediation with the Father to take the, and have the acknowledgement that yes, my blood has covered this sin and now that gives me the right to deal with it. To take it away so that that way this person doesn't have to suffer the crime because it has been canceled on this person's account. Amen. Atonement. Satisfaction. God has desired His people to understand these truths of salvation. And they have been holy, completely ignorant, of what their forefathers knew. God brought the, this institution of services as another way of teaching humanity. And sometimes in our frailties we need to go back to the sandbox of salvation. And I'm going to refer to the sandbox of salvation many times. So you can put a little note. Sandbox of salvation is the typical services, ordinances and services that was given to the children of Israel. That's the sandbox. Okay? When you're little children, you get in a sandbox and you make little roads and you make a little house and you make a little place for work and you travel on the roads with your little cars and you have a place for... All of that is practicing life. And the children of Israel was practicing an, an example of what was really going to be happening in heaven. On behalf of man, humanity. And so the sandbox of salvation, which is the ceremonial system, to understand the profound things of which God has given the ceremonial sacrificial system given to Moses and in people is our lesson book for today. Not just because today, but it is the end of time. It is because we are living in the last days. So why is the atonement needed? Why is it? Well, you're apart from God. Acts 3, 19-21. We read it in our scripture reading. We're going to read it again. Repent ye therefore that your sins may be blotted out. In other words, we talked about it last week. Our sins are covered, but they have what? Not yet been they haven't been blotted out. So Peter is saying to the people of Israel, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. When is that? You see, now we get to verse 20. And He, who's the He? God the Father. God the Father shall send Christ, Jesus Christ, which was before, was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until what? The times of restitution of all things. Remember, Christ is before the Father and He's making restitution for all the sin that He has covered. And until that restitution is made, He can't leave His Father's throne. Okay? Which God has spoken by the mouth of His holy prophets since when? 
since the world began. In other words, Peter is saying, don't you forget, Adam knew this, Noah knew this, Abraham knew it, and you know it, if you'll accept it. Amen. That's the question. Amen. Why atonement? To make restitution, like we said. Jesus paid the cost of all sin in humanity. Let's never forget it. He paid the cost of all sin, not just a few sins. All sin. You need to understand what transpires in the atonement and why it's necessary. Remember, we talked about it last week. God, through His Son, pays for all sin at the cross. And this is where a lot of ecumenical preachers will say, well, that's universal coverage. That means that no matter what you do on earth, you're going to heaven. But that's not what the Bible teaches, does it? No. Yes, Christ's blood covers all the sin, but now what? Who is accepting that blood and who isn't? Makes the big difference. Why the atonement? We're finding out. What is it necessary? Let's remember. Scripture reading again. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 11 and 12. Verse 11. Now all things happened for what? For examples. For examples. For whose admonition? Was it for the Corinthians? No, it wasn't. It was for us. Unless you don't think the world's coming to an end. If you think we're going to be here for another 300 years, then this isn't for you then either. But it really is because the world is not going to last much longer. Even the heathen know that. Verse 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. The servant of the Lord, the prophet of God, says this, Those who by faith follow Jesus in the great work of atonement receive the benefits of His mediation in their behalf. And then there's that little big word, but... Which cancels out everything before the but. If the but is you. Those who reject the light. That brings to view this work of ministration. Are what? Not benefited. Are not benefited by it. So in other words, if you are not cooperating with the ministry of Christ right now in heaven... Your sins cannot be forgiven. You are never going to make it to heaven. Because the benefits of being part of the Day of Atonement is salvation. The Jews who rejected the light given at Christ's first advent and refused to believe in Him as the Savior of the world could not, what? Could not receive pardon through Him. When Jesus at His ascension entered by His blood into the heavenly sanctuary to shed upon His disciples the blessings of His mediation, the Jews were left in what kind of darkness? Oh. Now, have you ever been in total darkness? Do you know what total darkness is? I've told the story before, I'll tell it again. Going in Mammoth Cave. <laughs> My wife says, the Mammoth Cave. You can tell that story? Yes, Mammoth Cave. You go in the Mammoth Cave and you're a mile down. They've got lights, electricity. They've got lights through the whole cave. But they get you down there with about 70 people. And the guy says, you know, how dark it really is down here, and instantaneously the lights go out. There is no possibility of light. No hint of a possibility of light. 
In fact, you can hit yourself in the nose and not realize it, how close your hand really was. Until you felt it against your nose. It cancels out every sense. Unless you're blind and have this perception of sound and things that sighted people don't have, when you lose your sight instantaneously, your whole mind goes, boom, 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 boom. what's going on? It's dark, total darkness. That's why the Jewish leadership was in so confusion. And they continued in their what? Useless, Useless. Useless. sacrifices and offerings. Yeah. What about today? Are there people who are going through the motions of uselessness in their services? Yes, there is. We're going to talk about it more. The ministration of types and shadows had ceased. Why he had ceased? Because Christ had died. He had raised from the dead. That door by which men had formerly found access to God was no longer open. open. The Jews had refused to seek Him in the only way by where He could be found. Through the ministration of the sanctuary in heaven. Therefore they found no communion with God. Now, if they found communion, who was it with? Okay, if they found communion and it wasn't with God, it would have to be with the demons of hell. And that's why there is a huge amount of Jewish people who now are being used of Satan more and more around the world. They still have the blessings of how to take care of money. And let me tell you something. Most of the high influential world people are all Jewish. But they're all serving Satan. The God of this world. To them the door was shut. They had no knowledge of Christ as the, the true sacrifice. The only mediator before God. And hence, they could not receive the benefits of His mediation. You see, just like the Jews who fought to preserve their church system, today there are those who are doing the same thing. They're fighting to keep their own church systems. Which they are also rejecting Jesus because they are not following Him in His work in heaven. Remember, it is impossible. What did the prophet of God say? Impossible. impossible to receive the benefits of the working of the high priest in heaven if you are not by faith abiding with Him in the most holy place. If you are not cooperating with what's going on. Man. He's there and interceding to make restitution of everything. Jesus has given His people an individual work to do. And yet, if we are stubbornly refusing to cooperate, we stubbornly refuse holding on to our traditional church systems of watered-down theology. God says, will be just like the Jews with no communication with God. Not some. Not a little bit. Zero. And just like down there in that cave, when it <laughs> is zero, that means there's no light. Amen. All Christians who profess Christ yet refuse all right we're gonna make 
this thing work. Refuse to accept the open door in heaven. We'll be praying to Satan and not to our Heavenly Father. Note the prophet of God. In early writings, we've read this quote before. I turned and looked at the company who were still bowed before the throne. This is the company that was bowed before the throne in the holy place, which is the table of showbread. They what? They did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared. Now he wasn't there. But he appeared to be by the throne trying to carry out the work of God. You see, there is a whole lot of people professing Christianity that they don't have God. That's right. They have a profession of God. But they don't have Him. Because they haven't followed Him. And so they do their profession. And God and Satan tries to carry on the work. And the prophet says, I saw them look to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. And Satan would breathe upon them an unholy influence. In it, now get this. In it, there were it were, there was what? Light and what? Much power. Much power. In other words, you can go in there and you can have a really good experience. Mm -hmm. Oh, I went to church today. Mm -hmm. Did you go and see your father in heaven? Did you go for entertainment? Did you go for a good exciting time but never really was taught? There's no sweet love, no joy, no peace. You see, Satan's object was to keep them deceived. That's the bottom line. If we do not follow Christ, we'll be praying to an empty throne. In 1844, Jesus and the Father left the throne in the holy place and moved into the most holy. There were the majority that never followed by faith. Let us never forget. God winks at the ignorance of His people. But he commands everyone to repent Amen. when they learn Amen. what the truth is. God will not allow Satan to completely hold in deception anyone who is sincerely seeking Jesus to be in their lives Amen. and yet is still blinded by the truth. Don't I get judgmental on people who don't understand it the way you do. Amen. Pray for them. Because they're still seeking. And if they're still seeking to have Christ in them, the hope of glory, the Holy Spirit will penetrate all of the traditional stupidity that is out there. Amen. But in this age of increasing knowledge, technology, which I'm trying to use today, it's not working real well, but we'll get there. In this age of technology, there's few that really have an excuse of ignorance. And I'm going to tell you, I, dear, I, I, I firmly believe this, that God has given this church the opportunity and the ability to broadcast worldwide the, the, and get people interested in taking Bible studies worldwide and there's a reason why people in the southeast, the South Pacific and, and all over the Muslim community in the world around, there are people taking Bible studies. 
I really believe that God is allowing this to happen for a reason. Because if somebody in the United States says, well, I didn't know. God will say, my little brother, would you, would you stand up? Where are you from? Oh, I, I'm, I'm from Africa. I, I, I had to walk five miles one way just to get to the Internet Cafe. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, God showed me that there was something I needed to hear. How much time do we really, how much effort do we really put into studying God's Word in this country? Right. We're lazy, good for nothing most of the time. Mm -hmm. So many are blinded by cultural traditions both in and out of the church in every denomination including Seventh-day Adventism. Mm -hmm. God's Word is buried from the light of day. We need to be passionately interceding for our families and our friends and yes, the world at large that God's Spirit will not be withheld from the true seeker of present truth in their lives. That the sentinels of, of God's holy army will guard and protect every human being no matter where they are on the face of this earth if they are seeking God's truth. You can have 5,000 people wanting to kill you, but if you've got the angels around you, no one can touch you. Amen. Amen. The question resounds, was not Jesus' death on the cross complete sacrifice enough? Yes, for what it was intended. As we have learned, there's more to it than that. The question comes up, does not this atonement idea that you're coming up with take away from the fact that Jesus died for my sin? No, it doesn't. It actually makes it more important. You see, both of these questions are clearly and distinctly answered by God in the example of what He has given. Not what man has tried to contrive. You see, the type that God gave in the representation of what He's doing to restore humanity, the little sandbox, if you please. Don't reject the Jewish people and say, that's their idea. No, that was God's lesson for humanity. Amen. Just because they didn't get it right don't mean you have to not get it right. That's right. You see, the fact of the matter is ever since Adam sinned, God has been on a mission. He's been on a mission. He says, I created man. And man took a wrong turn at the right opportunity. And I am going to get them turned around and they are going to fulfill the purpose that I created them for. And I'm going to Risk all of heaven in giving my son. That's what Christ is all about. You see, as anciently as the sins of the people were by faith placed upon the sin offering and through its blood transfigured in figure to the earthly sanctuary, so in the covenant, new covenant, the sins of the repentant are by faith placed upon Christ. And because they're placed on Christ, where's Christ? He's in heaven. And when He bore all sin at the cross, He took all sin, past, present, and future, to heaven with Him. This is, this is important that we understand. In a typical system, 
which was a shadow of the sacrifice and the priesthood of Christ. The cleansing of the sanctuary was the last service performed by the high priest in the yearly round of ministration. In the closing work of the atonement, a removal or putting away of sin from Israel. It prefigured the closing work of the ministration of our high priest in heaven. In the removal or blotting out of the sins of his people, which are registered in the heavenly books. Turn to Romans 11 with me. We're going to open up our Bibles and we're going to take a look at a few things and answer some questions that may just surprise you a little bit. Romans 11, we're going to be there for a while. Who really is the Israel spoken of here? Is it really just the physical Israel, which is also today? Is it some reference only to the direct descendants of Abraham? Or is there something much greater, much more revealing of the power of God? Romans 11, let's look at verse 15 to start with. Romans 11, verse 15. If you're there, say amen. 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 All right. Amen. For if, but if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall be, what shall the receiving of them be but life from dead? Verse 15, for, 16, for if the first fruit be what? Holy. Holy. The lump is what? Holy. Holy. And if the root be holy, so is what? The branches. The branches are holy. All right. Verse 17, and if some of the branches be broken off, thou... Oh, he's talking to the... Who is he talking to? Gentiles. He's talking to the Gentiles. Yeah. Being a wild olive tree, were grafted among them, and with them partake of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the... You mean to tell me there was a little bit of contention between the Gentiles and the Jews? Paul is addressing an important issue right here, isn't he? In other words, wait a minute. You're both in the same vine now. No prejudice in this in this vine. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Verse 19, thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be what? Grafted in. Grafted what a ego trip that guy had, didn't he? Jesus said something in John 15, verse 1. He says, I am the true vine. And my Father is the husbandman. You see, it's not by happenstance that we call this His vine, Free Seventh-day Adventist Church. Because the Father is the husbandman. That's why it's the His. The vine is referring to Jesus Christ. Because this is his church. Amen. It's not anybody's church. It's His church. And the people that come here are Seventh-day Adventists because they are looking forward to the second coming of Christ and they are going to worship with each other here in this sanctuary on God's holy Sabbath day. Amen. It's sermons right there in the name. Where do you go to church? Who you're worshiping? Who is important in this church? It's all right there. 
every branch in me that what? Beareth not fruit. Beareth not fruit. He taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he does what? Purges it. Purges it. That it may bring forth more fruit. More fruit. Verse 5. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Back to, ver back to Romans 11 now. I hope you stayed there. I told you we're going to be there a while. Paul says again, well, because of unbelief, they were what? Broken off. What did we talk about the Jews that didn't accept Jesus? They were left in darkness. That was the cutting off. No communication with heaven. No communication with Jesus the vine. So they're cut off. Okay, that's the cutting off. Broken off because of unbelief. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but what? Fear. Fear. Verse 21. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not who? Us. That's right. Remember, just a couple of sermons ago, we said, remember Shiloh. Amen. We're saying it again. Paul is saying it again. Don't you get so high mighty you were born a Seventh-day Adventist. Because with unbelief, you can get cut off too. Because there's a whole lot of other people that's going to get grafted in. And they're going to be a whole lot more productive than this person out here that says, I've been born a Seventh-day Adventist than I've been. No. God says, don't you get so high-minded. Remember what I did to Shiloh? Verse 22, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them fell severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be what? Cut off. Cut off. And they also, if they abide not still, in unbelief shall be grafted in for God is able to graft in them again. Amen. 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 Don't get so hasty when someone rejects you the first time. Pray for them. That they not blaspheme the Holy Spirit and cut themselves off completely. For God is in the business of saving, not damning. Amen. God wants to graft you in. He is looking, he's seeking and searching and he's, he's trying with all his might to do everything he can to graft you in. But if you keep stubbornly unbelieving his way, he can't do anything but reject you because you've rejected Him. Verse 24, For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which was wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into the good olive tree. Do you have a nature that's good? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Anybody here telling you that you've got a nature that's good, they're lying to you. The only way you're going to get anything good is to be grafted in. To get that new life of Christ flowing through you. How much more shall these, which shall be natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Verse 25, For I would not, brethren, 
that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Lest ye be wise in your own what? Oh my. Paul is hitting everything, isn't he? So easy is it to be conceited when you think you got it all. Amen. That the blindness in part happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Verse 26, And so shall all Israel be saved. Who is the Israel? Everybody who's grafted in. It doesn't matter where you came from. It's where you're grafted in. It's a question we got to ask ourselves every day when we get up. Are you grafted in? As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer that shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For what? This is my covenant. For this is my covenant unto them. When what? I will take away their sins. I will take away their sins. You see, this is the work by which Jesus must accomplish before He returns to take away our sins. Why? Why must this work be accomplished? Why must all this Day of Atonement stuff be completed? Revelation is very clear. 22 verse 12. My reward is what? With me. With me to give to every man according to His work. Work shall be. There's got to be a time when Jesus is figuring out, confirming who has brought the profession of Christianity to a reality by His faith. Revelation 14.6 makes it very clear. With a loud voice, the people of God will have the right message ordained of God to bring to a lost and dying world. And so if you think you're professing the right message, but you're not bringing it to the world, you've got a problem. This message is in complete form is Revelation 14, 6 through 13. Yes, the pastor did say 13, not 12. We dealt with that earlier. We'll deal with it again. Many people forget that 13 is actually part of the three angels' messages. And we, we dealt with it before. Study it for those who have not. The first angel's message of judgment has begun, must be clearly and distinctly heard by God's faithful Daily, not only from the ministers, but the lady also must be shining forth from their lives this message of the gospel. Because so many, so many are not they are just they don't know that we're in the day of atonement. It is something that is very important for us to know, to realize. Thousands of professed Christians know nothing of the fulfillment of Daniel 9 as it relates to the Jewish nation. True. That is why you have so many foolish things going on. If we can raise us $5 million, we can, we can, we can rebuild the temple. And the sacrificial system can be reinstituted by the Jewish people, and then the Messiah will come.
because of all this confusion runs wild, yet Jesus proclaims through Paul, God is what? Not. Not the author of confusion. So let us review Daniel 9. So guess what you guess where you're going? Daniel 9. We're going with Daniel 9. Turn to Daniel 9. We have on the screen a chart of Daniel 8:14 on 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now this is going to be up here a while, so you guys can take notes. Let's try to get all this stuff understood. Daniel 9, verse 23. We're going to speedily go through this. We'll deal with it on a regular basis here for the next few months. Daniel 9, verse 23. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I come to show thee. Who's talking? Gabriel. Gabriel. He's standing beside the royal throne in the universe of heaven. And he, Daniel begins to pray and God says, you got it, you got, it's time to go. Now a couple weeks ago we talked about Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9. What was he praying? A prayer of confession. A prayer of confession. Was he a holy man? Yes, he was. Did he need any confessing? No, he didn't. But who was he confessing for? His people. He and his people. He said, Lord, Father, we have messed up. We're not where we're supposed to be. We're in Babylon. We're not over there where the temple is. Was. Was is right because what happened to it? It was, it was dust. Yeah. It was literally wiped out. Nothing there. The city was gone. No walls. Nothing. It was. It was. Nothing. People walked by it and hiss at it. The foolishness of those people. Daniel says, "We've sinned, Lord." So Gabriel says, "Come and show thee." Thou art greatly beloved. Oh, to have Gabriel come down and talk to you like that. <coughs> That's saying something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Daniel, you're greatly loved. You're greatly loved, Daniel. For thou art greatly loved. Therefore, understand the matter. And consider the vision. Now, what vision was Gabriel talking about? Chapter 8. Okay. Chapter 8. Yeah. Remember, there's no divisions in the original. Yeah. But there had been a lot of time. There had been a considerable length of time between Daniel 8, 14 and Daniel 9. We know that Daniel was getting this vision from God and he got up to this 2300 day prophecy and Daniel fainted because it was just too much for him to handle. Now, the prophecy of Daniel 8.14, if you'll just turn over there, is there anything in Daniel 8.14 that says when the prophecy begins? No. Is there anything that says when it be ends? No. Well, no. Yes. When the sanctuary is cleansed, yes. When the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. Yes. But it doesn't give a date. No. So Daniel is really confused. He doesn't have a beginning. He doesn't really have an ending. He just knows there's a whole lot going on. And the sanctuary is going to be cleansed, but yet it's, 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 it's not even in existence right now. And so he's really confused and he gets sick. And then we find out as we're studying through Daniel 8 and 9 that Daniel is studying this with the books that they have, and he realizes, Jeremiah says, 70 years, and, 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 and the people of God are going to be going back. And Daniel says, wait a minute, that 70 years is pretty much up. So that's when he starts praying. And Gabriel comes to him. 
verse 24, the Gabriel says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and seal up the vision and the prophecy, and anoint the most holy. Now there's a whole lot there. Amen. And we could spend the next hour just on that one verse, but we're not. We're, like I said, we're going to go over it real quickly. Seventy weeks, right here, Daniel nine twenty four. Seventy weeks, three hundred, four hundred and ninety years. Verse twenty five. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The streets shall be built again, the wall even in troublous times. So now the beginning date is when? When Jerusalem is to be restored. Okay? Now, there's three decrees that Ezra records. There's only one, and that's the third one, in Ezra 7, 1 to 27. This is the only one that completely restores Jerusalem with its government, its religion, everything is allowed to be restored. The others are both incomplete. But the last one, the third one, you read it, it is detailed. And it goes into a whole lot. Of, and it's very clear that this is the what it was, and that was in its historical fact. So you can't argue with it, all right? Don't, don't try to. You're, because then you would be accused rightly of rewriting history 457 BC that decree went out now was it an easy job no. no oh no that's what the whole book of Nehemiah is about yep. and he got there late and he got yes he did that was down the road a while Oh, the mess that the children of Israel did in trying to get things built and restored. It was a mess. They never really got it going good. It started in 457 B.C. All right? Now, 69 weeks brings us down The anointing of the Messiah. Christ's baptism. The beginning of His work. In the middle of the week, a week is seven. The middle is three and a half. How many years did Christ minister on this earth before the crucifixion? Three and a half years. Do you think it's con uh, consequential? No. 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 It was prophesied that way. The fullness of time came and Christ died in the middle of the week just like He said He would. And after the three score, after the score, three score and two weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off. But not for Himself. And the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. What is Daniel talking about? Destruction. The destruction of Jerusalem. Again. It gets built up the Messiah is anointed, then He is crucified, and then after that, the temple, the sanctuary, Jerusalem, is wiped up again. Let's get it right. Verse 27. 
And he shall confirm the covenant. Who's the he? Jesus. 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 Very good. With many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Cross. The cross of Christ. All of the ceremony services are done away with Amen. in the middle of the week. And the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Even unto the consummation. And that shall determine, shall be poured upon the desolate. Let's turn to Hebrews 11. You see, there's a whole lot here we're going to deal with. And it's all about the Day of Atonement now, isn't it? We're talking about the Day of Atonement. We're talking about the Day of Atonement. The confirming of the covenant. Which covenant? The new covenant. The new covenant, that's correct. Or the better covenant. Yes. The covenant that had the better promises. Yes. Sabbath school. Oh, it's not by happenstance we're studying the book of, of Hebrews right after Romans. We've learned so much about the salvation and the gospel by verse by verse understanding it and getting down to even the words sometimes that we overlook the little words that mean so much and the reason why they're put there. Oh, it would make so much more easy if we would plow deep in the Word of God and not skim by it. So when was that first covenant given? When was that new, better covenant first given? Adam. Adam, that's correct. Genesis 3.15 I will put what? Enmity. Enmity between thee and the woman. Now, who's the I? God. God says, I'm promising it. Yeah. I'm promising it. I'm the one going to make the changes. For those of you in the sanctuary, the, the diagram that we had on the screen, I'll, I'll print it out after church. That way you have a copy of it because it is a very special diagram. Some of us were really trying to move fast, get that all copied down. I know, I know. Hey, it's hard sometimes to get everything in, isn't it? I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. All of Daniel 9 is right there. All of the new covenant is right there. Everything. That's why we know it was given to Adam. But sometimes we skim over it and all oh, that's no, no, it's it's right there. It was affirmed to Noah and then to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hebrews eleven. Are you there yet? Yes, amen. Okay. I gave you warning. Now we're here. Romans or Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. This is not the kind of fear that he was scared. He was awed. Reverence. Reverence. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. By the which he condemned the world and became what? Heir. Heir of righteousness, which is what? By faith. By faith. Amen. Verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out. Not what? Knowing not knowing where he was going to go. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to play a little game with you. Most of us own our houses. I, I'm blessed by having a landlord that 
is probably one of the best landlords on the face of the earth, and I, I appreciate him more than than any other person other than my wife and the Lord. But if God was going to tell you, sell your house, put all your stuff in a vehicle, and leave, and I'll tell you when to stop, would you sell the house? Now, would you sell the house if you had, you were told that you were going, not your family, your mama, your daddy, your brothers and sisters, you're supposed to leave everybody. Now, Abraham, when he first left Ur, he took everybody with him, and then they stopped. And Abraham got called by God again. He says, God, God says, hey, wait a minute, Abraham. I said you, not everybody else. And so Abraham left by himself and his godson. Lot was his godson. His, his nephew, that's correct. Which he was charged by his brother to take care of because his brother died. That's why Lot was with Abraham. Because he was taking care of that son. Just like as if I had a brother and he says, okay, I'm dying. I need you to take care of my son. That son now goes with me as if it's my son, kind of your godson or however you want to put it. Adopted son. So now, Abraham leaves with his family. With no destination given. Except the Lord says, I'm going to show you when you get there. Ooh, would you do it? Oh, it's easy for us to say it, but would we really? No, we need to think about it. God's asking us to do things by faith. Are we willing to take Him by, by, by His Word? You see, the same thing can be to us. Do we trust in the money in the bank? Do we trust in everything that we have? Or do we trust in God? See, that's where the bottom line is. You see, if we're trusting the money in the bank, then we're not trusting God. Something to think about. By faith, verse 9. By faith he surjoined into the land of promise. As in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Amen. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is who? God. God. In other words, Abraham knew that he was never going to get where he was going on this earth. He had, was going to some place that was a whole lot better. Amen. And he separated from everything that was going to hold him back. Now the question is, where in the Bible does it say what Abraham's covenant was? It really doesn't. Except for one place. Genesis 26. Genesis 26. Speaking to Isaac, God reestablished what he had with Abraham. Genesis 26, verse 2. And reading. Genesis 26. So we need to know where these covenants are and, 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 and verify. We've been talking about it in Sabbath school, but we've been saying it was in effect from Adam all the way through, but now we're going into verses in the Bible, we're actually seeing the covenant was there. It was established by faith with all these patriarchs. Genesis 26, verse 2, 
And the Lord appeared unto him and said what? Go not, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell, of, tell thee of. Verse 23. Sojourn in this land and I will what? Be with thee. Be with thee. I will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all of these countries and I will perform the oath which I swear unto who? Abraham thy father. Abraham thy father. Verse 4. And I shall and I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of the heaven and I will give unto thy seed all these countries and in thy seed shall all of the nations of the earth be blessed. Who is that talking about? Jesus. Jesus, amen. Verse 5, Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge. What was that? My charge. Kept my charge. What's the next one? My commandments. My commandments. My statutes. My statutes and, my and my what? Laws. laws. Now, refresh my memory. I, I, sometimes I get forgetful. <laughs> what did God give Moses? The law. The law. Okay. The law. The commandments. Commandments. Statutes. statutes charges. Sir. The charges. Everything that God gave Abraham, He gave it to Moses. to Moses. So, did Abraham know it? Yes. yes. Did Isaac know it? Yes. yes. Yep. Did Jacob know it? Yes. Yep. Did Noah know it? Yes. Yep. Did Adam know it? Yes. Yep. Do you see how the consistency of it is not just a Jewish thing? It's not just, no, it's a humanity thing. Amen. We need to remember that. Don't let people get you all twisted up into this little box and say, no, 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 wait a minute. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. Turn to Hebrews 8, verse 10. I should have told you to stay in Hebrews because I'm having you go all over the place today. Amen. You'll actually learn how to read your Bible pretty soon if you stay in here long enough. Oh, Hebrews 8.10 Hebrews 8.10 right. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of who? Israel. Who is Israel? Spiritual Israel. Yeah. Spiritual. But who was the original Israel? Uh -huh. Huh? Who was the original Israel? No, they were the people of Israel. Who was the original Israel? Abraham. No, I don't. Jacob. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was. Oh, oh. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> Jacob was Jacob until he what? Wrestled with God, and God, and he said, "God, bless me, or I'm not going to let you go." And, he's, and God says, "What?" You're no longer Jacob, but Israel. Israel. Okay. So the house of Israel. So in other words, the house of the overcomer. The yes. one who struggled with God. Do you passionately struggle with God for your salvation? saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and I will write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be a people. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. You see the act of God putting His law in the minds, writing it in the lives. It is important. The law of God will be in our mental and physical being placed there by God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And because God puts it there, and because the Holy Spirit is in us, He will lift our spiritual lives and will be translated into the courts of heaven right now. 
Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Let's get this right. Our spiritual realm of life must be in heaven. It must be in the most holy place. Yes. We must receive translation before our physical bodies get there. Amen. Colossians 1, 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. When you are converted, you are re what? Delivered. Delivered. Darkness. You're born again. The old man dies. You're delivered. And what? Hath translated, Hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear, dear son. Mm -hmm. In whom we have redemption through his blood even for the forgiveness of sin. Notice, hath translate. In other words, it's past tense. Amen. Not will translate it. Hath translate it. When we have been delivered from the power of darkness, God, through the, our spiritual realm, has brought us and has promised to translate us into heaven now. God is offering to all who will unreservedly surrender to His sovereign will to to have God's character put into their minds, lived out in their lives, transforming the spiritual experience to be completely in harmony with His will. That we will be in constant communion with our sovereign Heavenly Father. Are you constantly in communion or do you go in and out? Everything we do, every step we take in our lives will then be in His will. This is what it means to be abiding in Jesus moment by moment. It is this is the only way we can experience life in of the life of Jesus fully in our lives, never staggering, but fully persuaded by his faith. It's clear. It is done by the power of the Holy Spirit. His living word. Yet the reality is the thousands are being deceived into thinking everything was done at the cross. And Jesus and God the Father says, No, wait a minute. No, it wasn't. My son has brought all the sin of humanity with him. He bought it with his life. He paid the eternal price. He now is claiming His blood covering these sins confessed and repented of. And yet the work of removal is yet to be accomplished. Remember Acts 3.19. Let your sins be blotted out. Remember first is repentance. Then to be converted. That your sins will be blotted out. When? The times of refreshing. Oh, for the closer walk. Oh, for the closer walk like Enoch walked. To be in His presence moment by moment, closer and closer and closer, by faith, living by the throne in the universe. You see, when you're next to the throne, you're where all the power is. And don't be, don't be shocked if people, when you start talking to them, say, well, wait a minute, will you slow down? I don't quite understand you because you, you're talking way above my head. That's because you're next to the throne. You're talking a language they don't understand because they're not converted. There's a lot of people professing Christianity that are not converted. We've got to completely surrender. Let us daily walk with Him. Closer, closer. Yes, even closer. The Holy Spirit, please empower me this day. Empower me every day. Let each one of us die daily to all of self and live in Jesus. Let us walk daily by the unction of the Holy Spirit. Walk by faith. 
and surely we will be walking in Him. Amen. As we close our service, the beautiful psalm, A Closer Walk. This psalm was written in the 1600s. The psalm rarely sung today, but surely let it be our prayer that, Lord, I need a closer walk. Show me how to get rid of all the stuff that encumbers my life, that hampers me from being one with you. And then give me the ability to surrender it, Lord, because I am so in love with this world. We've got to recognize we love this world too much. Let us die completely. As we sing, let us stand. Oh, for a closer walk with God. Investigative work is going on right now, and we surely want to cooperate with you 100%. That the life of your Son will fully engulf our lives, empower us, and strengthen us to serve thee like we never could before. And also, Lord, we, we, we dearly look forward to that day when all of our sins are blotted out. For surely we will not be able to stand when you come if they are not blotted out. 
We seek your face. We seek your power and strength through the Holy Spirit. Cleanse us and fill us. Empower us and strengthen us to be a blessing to the community in which we live. Glorify thy name. You promise that the perfection of your people is, is enveloped and it is, involves the, the honor of you, Father. The honor of your Son. So use your Holy Spirit, Lord, and purify us. Bring us into that right connection with you at one with your throne, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Oh, it is here we know abiding. 